All right, I'm Bailey Cashmore and I'm from the University of Waterloo Crisp Lab. Today I'll be talking to you about some joint work with Chelsea Kamla, Florian Kirschbaum, and Ian Goldberg on ceremonies for applied secret sharing, specifically the gap that exists between the theory and practice for secret sharing schemes. At a high level, when talking about secret sharing, we're going to have some secret S. This secret could be a document, a short message, or something like a key or password. This secret belongs, so to speak, to a group of n participants. Here we have n equals 3 participants with Alice, Bob, and Carol. The nature of the document that these people have requires that some subset of them must be in agreement about accessing the secret. The size of the subset required to access the secret is referred to as the threshold T. In this case, Alice, Bob, and Carol have decided on a 2-3 threshold scheme to ensure that they can still access their secret if one of them is no longer available. A threshold of 2 also means that any one of Alice, Carol, or Bob can be unavailable and the secret could still be accessed. However, none of them can access the secret on their own. The effects of the chosen threshold discussed on the previous slide can more formally be stated as the two properties, reconstruction and secrecy. These properties are realized in a well-known construction due to Shamir. A Shamir threshold scheme generates n shares, one for each participant, by distributing points lying on a polynomial, where the degree of the polynomial is the size of the threshold minus one. Since each participant has a point on the polynomial, a subset of t participants can combine their shares using polynomial interpolation to recover the secret, satisfying the reconstruction property, while any less than t will not leak any information about the secret. Secret sharing constructions, like a Shamir threshold scheme, define two functions. Share generation, which here is depicted as the blue one on the left of the screen, and secret recovery, which is the pink one on the top right of the screen. In this work, we include these algorithms as stages, and as well as including everything in between them, and the functionality that can occur before share generation and after secret recovery in our analysis. To give you some insight as to why we include these additional components later on, let's take a look at what can instigate a secret sharing protocol to be employed. So to highlight two sample use cases, these use cases can show uh, how threshold schemes support high variability in even similar scenarios that employ an identical underlying threshold scheme, but the threat model, context, and goals are different. In case one, which is going to be the one in the top half of the slide, we will explicitly require all of the steps for what we term extended mode. Uh, extended mode secret sharing has a uh, additional encryption step, while case two will only require the steps our participants execute to come from the base mode, what would be a more conventional series of steps for secret sharing. In both of these cases, Alice, who is a journalist, has received highly sensitive information from a source. In case one, she has received a series of plain text documents, and in case two, she has received a key to a set of publicly released encrypted documents. Alice fears external parties will act against her to prevent from disseminating this information, or in case two, that these external parties may attempt to distribute the key in a way that could endanger individuals, she wants to ensure that even if an adversary succeeds at targeting the information can still be accessed by either herself or by her trusted colleagues, and that an unauthorized party cannot unilaterally release the information. She decides to enlist the help of her colleagues Bob and Carol to reach her goals. So let's start our shared generation for case one. Alice needs to first encrypt the documents she has received, as the files are large enough that she doesn't find it practical to put them through a base mode of secret sharing. After encrypting the files on the laptop she acquired, she then uses the decryption key as the secret she inputs into the share generation algorithm. Since there are three of them, herself, Bob, and Carol, she sets the number of participants n to three, and to ensure that she has some redundancy, if one of them loses their share while also not allowing one share to be enough to decrypt the files, she sets the threshold to two. The share generation algorithm outputs the three shares as required, and Alice keeps one for herself and selects how she wants to store her share to keep it safe. Alice then sends one share each to Bob and Carol over a previously established secure communication channel they used to send messages to one another, and finally Bob and Carol, upon receiving their shares, select appropriate storage mechanisms for those shares. In case two, Alice only has a decryption key as a secret, and so she doesn't have to do any extra work in advance with respect to encrypting the files. Again, we're in a base mode here. Instead of receiving the shares via technology, 
Bob and Carol meet up with Alice at an agreed upon physical location where they use an air gap laptop to execute the share generation algorithm with the decryption key as the secret input and the same threshold and number participant settings as in case one. When the algorithm outputs the shares, they each copy a share over to their novelty floppy disk shaped USB sticks and delete all information off the laptop before heading their separate ways. Now, although we haven't yet talked about how Alice, Bob, and Carol are going to recover their secrets, we can already talk about some of the gaps that Alice faced when trying to secure the information entrusted to her. From a theory perspective, we have clearly defined mathematical algorithms for taking a secret S and producing a series of shares such that to recover that secret in the future would require a certain size subset of those shares. However, in practice, as is so often the case, we have stored requirements, communication channels, choosing appropriate thresholds, all of which we saw Alice face in the previous examples. Alice had to decide whether to meet in person, send shares digitally, how to store the shares, what to compute the shares on, and what thresholds made sense for her situation. In short, there are human actions and decisions that were needed and have to be accounted for in analyzing, analyzing the security of these threshold schemes. In our work, we will account for these actions and decisions and look at secret sharing through the lens of ceremony analysis and how the people within the system affect the security of the system as a whole. Ceremonies, or ceremony analysis, was introduced by Ellison in 2007. Ceremonies encompass everything outside the protocol, but in scope for the user. We can illustrate what a ceremony is by considering the TLS protocol. TLS relies on a mathematical cryptographic primitive, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. TLS encompasses the key exchange within the additional steps of the protocol definition that is TLS. Beyond the defined protocol of TLS, we have the human involvement in security of TLS. For example, with TLS, if a pop-up came up in this case of a bad certificate, the user's interaction and what they should appropriately do upon seeing this pop-up will be something that is included in the ceremony of TLS and is relevant for TLS to actually be able to provide that user with security. Similarly, a threshold scheme ceremony relies on a base mathematical construction, such as Shamir threshold schemes, and then can be encompassed by the protocol, that is what the computers do, as well as encompassed by the ceremony, what the people have to do. This brings us to our secret sharing ceremony analysis framework. At a high level, our framework can be summarized with the following components. One, identify the stages of the ceremony. This includes share generation and secret recovery, but also those things like distributing the shares to participants. Two, defining the threat model. Who are the adversaries? What are their abilities and goals? What are the security goals of the ceremony? Is it more important to protect the data from being released, even if that risks it being irrecoverable? Three, define the mode of operation. Does it only require a base mode or do you require some sort of extended mode, such as with the case when Alice had to encrypt a set of documents earlier? Finally, evaluate the security goals you've identified against the adversaries you have identified. Note that this isn't actually a strict sequential process, and there are relationships between the components I have listed here. We will now use Sunder, which is one of our case studies in the paper, as an example to illustrate and walk through our framework. Sunder is a tool that was developed by Freedom of the Press and actually was part of the original inspiration for our work. In our analysis, we include the tool's documentation on what you should do when using Sunder as part of its ceremony. Sunder defines a base and extended mode and was targeted at journalists as the intended users. Interestingly, the development of Sunder was also part of the motivation for the recent work from Belair, Dai, and Rogue. They also work to address the gaps between theory and practice for secret sharing. They treat secret sharing as a sort of or flavor of encryption and do not deviate from a strict share generation secret recovery structure. Well, as I said earlier, we use ceremony analysis and include components outside of strictly generation recovery. Let's say we have additional stages and algorithms included in our ceremony framework. To get us started with what those additional stages and algorithms are, let's look at which ones are included in Sunder. In the case of Sunder, we of course have the share generation and secret reconstruction stages, but note that we have added a separate stage, share distribution, in our framework as the stage that defines how participants receive their shares, distinct from the stage that generated the shares. Since Sender also works in extended mode, we include the two additional stages from our framework. 
The first new stage in extended mode is secret preparation. It encompasses the acquisition of the sensitive documents and their encryption. Essentially, it is any pre-processing or cleanup, where cleanup could be things like deleting the plain text files that is required, but is not encompassed by the shared generation or distribution phase. The second new phase connects, uh, or stage connects to the reconstruction stage. In the extended mode we have defined, you have only recovered the decryption key after completing reconstruction. The extended reconstruction stage encompasses any post-processing needed to retrieve the plain tag secret information. Thus, there are five framework stages to Sunder, and we are now ready to finish identifying the steps within the stages. In this talk, we are just going to walk through one stage here, uh, but the full identification process and the steps within each stage for Sunder can be found in our paper, as well as the full stages for our other case studies. Okay, so let's take a look at identifying the shared distribution stage for Sunder. When identifying the steps within a stage, each step can correspond to a human choice, action, or be executed by a device. In the case of shared distribution, there is no computation to be done in Sunder, and every step requires human effort. The first step requires whomever has been entrusted with the secret, let's just say it was Alice again, to decide who else they can enlist the help of. They have to make a choice as to the number of participants and who those participants are going to be. If they themselves are going to be a participant, they only have to choose n minus one other participants. In step two, Alice selects a way to send the data to the remaining participants. Should she meet a person? Should she use Signal? Something else? Her decision will rest on what her threat model looks like, as well as outside factors such as the physical proximity of the other participants. She may even use different channels for different participants if that is appropriate. Step three, having selected her participants and communication channels, Alice can send each participant their share. Since she's using Sunder, she will also send each participant the corresponding public verification key. In step four, Alice next must delete each share, except perhaps her own, if applicable and she is a participant, off of the device she chose to run the generation algorithm. Upon receiving a share, each participant, including Alice, must select an appropriate storage mechanism for their share. They will likely consider security and robustness against direct, uh, destruction during their selection. Finally, step six, the last action. Each participant stores their share and thus concludes the share distribution stage of the ceremony. Each step would similarly be identified as appropriate for each of the other stages we mentioned earlier for Sunder, so secret preparation and extended recovery and so on. Now let's talk a bit about the threat model we used when analyzing Sunder for detailed stages. We assumed a high-powered adversary with access to state-of-the-art computing resources and with significant quantities of time and money at their disposal. Such an adversary has the power to take legal action bounded only by the political environment of that jurisdiction. Adversaries may be participants or outsiders, and we do not assume roles are static. That is to say, a previously trusted participant may become an adversary at a later time in the protocol. For example, let's say one of our journalists from earlier, perhaps Carol, left the organization for another job. It may no longer be desirable to consider them a trusted party. Finally, the adversary's goals against someone using Sunder may include being motivated to learn the sensitive information, of course, uh, such as the secret documents given to Alice, through acquiring the secret key or the appropriate collection of shares. The adversary may wish to modify the secret document without detection, resulting in participants recovering information that is different than the original input. Adversaries may also seek to prevent others from accessing or disseminating the information in the sensitive document. So an adversary is seeking to hide information, such as a government seeking to prevent public distribution of evidence of war crimes, can work to disrupt communication, destroy shares, or even to destroy the sensitive data itself. When evaluating the security of a ceremony using our framework, such as the Sunder ceremony we've been working with thus far in this presentation, in addition to identifying the stages, the relevant modes of operation, and the relevant adversaries, it is also necessary to have identified the security goals of the ceremony. On this slide, we have a selection of goals that we identified for Sunder. Note that other ceremonies may have different goals not listed here. From our analysis, we are just going to highlight two of these goals for now in comparison to a Shamir threshold scheme. The first thing to highlight is that we grant information theoretic security, abbreviated in the table as ITSEC, as a ceremony-dependent feature of a classic Shamir threshold scheme. 
This is because it does not define how to communicate shares to participants, but if, for example, the ceremony specified the shares were transported in person and did not rely on a computationally secure communication channel, the ceremony could still be information theoretically secure. Although a similar argument could be made for Slender, it loses this property in trade for relying on a computational guarantee to get a more targeted share integrity property. If you look at the bottom row of the table, you will see Sunder in base mode achieves the property with term integrity. It does this by generating a public-private ephemeral key pair to sign shares during the generation stage. Share signatures are validated during the recovery stage to ensure both the validity of shares and also that all shares are signed by the same public key. However, Sunder does not include document encryption within the tool and thus does not support integrity validation for the encrypted documents. Consequently, Sunder only partially attains integrity for extended mode without uh, some additional defined components of the ceremony. After looking at our case studies, such as Sunder, we found some threats to secret reconstruction to be repeated. First, a practitioner could leave the organization and take the share with them. A share could be damaged or stolen, or the device storing the encrypted files could be destroyed. Thus, we proposed a ceremony within our framework which involved incorporating our lightweight, proactive, verifiable secret sharing scheme. Our lightweight, proactive VSS adds three new stages to our ceremony framework. Share update to allow access for vocation to participants as well as a way to modify shares when suspect someone may have been compromised such that the compromised shares cannot be used with the new shares and thus lose value to an adversary. Share validate which, as the name suggests, provides a way to validate the integrity of shares, and generate commitment, which provides a way to validate a secret files the secret files integrity to mitigate risks of covert file modification. Uh, to highlight the steps of one of our new stages, let's take a look at share validation. This stage requires human action, but no new human choices. A participant fetches the commitment that was generated in a separate phase from its trusted public location. They then execute the evaluation of the validation function and finally verify that the commitment they fetched matched their computation. The new share update stage has a participant initiate the process. In this case, uh, as depicted here, the update initiator is Carol. Carol runs the share generation stage for a new function, h of x, where the secret s is equal to zero. They use the same threshold and number of participants as in the initial run of share generation. In the example illustrated here, Bob is being removed from the scheme. So Carol does not send him an update and only sends Alice her share, uh, her update share, and keeps their own update for themselves. Alice and Carol then each compute their new updated share by combining their old share and the share of zero Carol computed. Finally, Carol publishes the verification update. Now, even if Bob acquired Carol's updated share, he would be unable to combine it with his own to learn the secret. He would need to acquire both Alice's and Carol's share to reconstruct the secret. So to highlight what we get by adding the additional stages needed for our lightweight proactive ESS, if you look at the last two rows in this table, you can see that we have gained confidentiality through the power of revocation and the robustness of being able to update shares in the case of some shares being compromised. We have also gained integrity through a commitment function to the secret document, as well as to the shares that have been generated. The details as to how we get these properties can be found in our paper, along with the detailed steps for each of these new stages. So to conclude, we present a framework to facilitate the analysis of practical threshold schemes. Variations in the ceremony, even seemingly small ones, can lead to changes in the fundamental security properties provided to end users. Finally, our framework can aid in the design and analysis of future implementations of secret sharing through its detailed ceremony definition and explicit coverage of previously undefined assumptions. Thank you for listening.